Right on. We're going to spend the next hour or so talking about some upcoming books and comics. Before we do that, though, uh, because this is the, the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi this year, we wanted to ask these fine panelists a little bit about their experiences with Return of the Jedi. So, for each of you, when did you first see Return of the Jedi? What were your first impressions? What does it mean to you? Delilah, we'll, we'll kick it off with you. Ooh, sorry, that's great. Yes, um, so Return of the Jedi was the first Star Wars movie I saw in the theater because of when I was born, movies weren't readily available. You had to wait for them to come on TV at three <laughs> o'clock on Sunday. Um, but it was the Ewoks that first got to me because when we had, um, of course, the uh, Battle for Endor TV show, and I got to stay, that was the first time I ever got to stay up past nine o'clock, and I saw a little girl land on a crash planet of uh, alien murder bears and become like their god, and I was like, <laughs> okay, I'm in for this forever. And that year, I was like, Christmas, it was nothing but Ewoks, and I had, you know, the where you push the button and R2-D2 goes, beep, and tells you to turn the page on your book. I had the color forms, everything. So yeah, I was, I was, I was sleeping on um, Star Wars sheets before I had seen Star Wars. Right. On. So it's just, it's in my atoms. That's awesome. Justina? Uh, yeah, same. I think that and E.T. are the two movies I remember seeing in the theater as a little kid. Um, but for me, it was kind of an upsetting time in my life because I, all I wanted was an Ewok, like for Christmas. And what I got instead was a Mon Chi Chi, which is not an Ewok. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, my mom kind of began the uh, not understanding the, the nerd stuff I was into at a very young age, so. <laughs> um, I don't remember the first time I saw Return of the Jedi, but we had the, like, book on tape on a vinyl record. Oh, my God, yeah. Um, and so I started listening to that when I was, like, three or so, and Darth Vader's breathing noises is, like, one of my core fears. So every time I'm near a cosplayer and I hear the, like, breathing, I'll be like, <laughs> and jump out of the way. I saw it at the theatres uh, when it came out, um, but for me what it really represents is um, action figures, because that's the phase, I was at that age, and I got the Ewok Village, and I remember... Okay. Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> Get out of here! So Do that's enough from George. <laughs> But I, well, the thing I actually remember most is saving up. We had a thing in the UK where um, they had a promotion for the Emperor, mm. and you had to save up cereal packet tokens. And I remember just eating so much cereal <laughs> through this, saving these tokens up. And the day he came in the post, it's, it's still emblazoned in my memory. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, ditto. And I think seeing Jabba's Palace for the first time and just seeing this sheer amount of aliens, and I quite like monsters, and there were just so many. And for years, I'd be very snobbing over well, Empire Strikes Back is my favorite movie, and it's great, but the one I always reach for is Return of the Jedi, and that's the one that gives me the most joy, so yay, and Ewoks. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, based on the way everybody's talking about it, I really got to check this movie out. It sounds incredible. <laughs> um, no, my, my first uh, encounter with Jedi, I, I did see it in the theater, but before that, um, I, I had spent years, like many, many people in my position, speculating about whether the things Darth Vader said at the end of Empire could possibly be true, um, what was going to happen, all of that. And then... You guys remember the scholastic book fairs? Like they'd come to the, okay, awesome, awesome things. And so you would go and you would, they would have books and, and um, your, your, your parents or would, would give you like a couple of bucks and you could buy a book usually. And, and at one of these, before the movie came out, they had the like little children's, like the little kid's picture book of Return of the Jedi well, well before the film was out because back then it wasn't quite a, as much of a clamp down on spoilers. So I got that and, and I, it, it only went through like the Jabba's Palace sequence, uh, and it didn't it didn't get into the big finale stuff at the end. So so I knew all about the Jabba's Palace stuff, but I didn't know all, all of the things that happened later. I didn't know about these Ewoks. That sounds super cool. You guys are so hyped about them. Um, <laughs> They're huge, <laughs> gigantic, yeah. gigantic, technologically advanced. Yeah. Um, so so that was really my first experience with it, and I. I, it didn't really spoil anything. I just was so excited to see this movie when I finally got the chance to do it. Uh, Return of the Jedi was made a huge impression on me for two reasons. One, to make sure you're not kissing your sister before you kiss your sister. <laughs> and then uh, two, I just, uh, the, the image of Luke winning by choosing not to fight anymore was just such a powerful image to me and that you could, you could win not by might but by doing what was right was like a big like, whoa, that's so profound, that's so deep. So I love that. That's awesome. 
All right, let's, uh, let's talk about some books and comics. We're gonna go into everything on the screen here. And before we do though, let's give a, uh, just a tease of, of, of what's here. So uh, Delilah, starting with you, one word to describe Rise of the Red Blade. Murder. <laughs> Accurate. Uh, Justina, one word for Sonastaros. Messy. Kate, Crimson Climb. Also murder. <laughs> yeah! Also accurate. Uh, George, how about uh, Tales of Light and Life, your story in there? Um, shield. Ooh, good one. Cav, we'll go with uh, Tales from the Death Star for you. Terror. <laughs> accurate. Uh, Charles, how about Jedi Brave in every way? Oh, just adorable. <laughs> That's how he describes himself. <laughs> and Mark, how about uh, from a certain point of view? Um, surprising. Ooh, yeah. Also accurate. All right, right on. Let's, let's dig in. We're going to start with uh, Delilah first. So Rise of the Red Blade came out this week. Congratulations. There's a con edition. Yeah, let's hear it for Delilah. We have a con edition uh, downstairs at the Penguin Random House booth. It's booth number 1515. If you look for the giant... PRH Book World on the ceiling, you'll see it. And they it's do still book. have some of the wristbands that you need to purchase this. So if you go there after this, there's a good chance you can get the Con Exclusive Edition, which is going to sell out. Yes. So this is, a, this is a very tight, very personal story. I'm wondering if you could tell the folks here a little bit about who uh, Iscat is and, and how you relate to her. So Iskata Karras is a Jedi Padawan who is, uh, she has more mystery than most. She doesn't know her species. Um, so she has uh, a lot of questions around being a Jedi because she doesn't feel like she quite fits in. Um, her connection to the Force is unique. She doesn't feel a super strong connection with her master and she really questions herself a lot. So while she thinks that she's a good, good-hearted Jedi who's trying really hard, it's almost like she feels like there are secrets that other people know that she doesn't about how to fit in and how to be a good Jedi and how to connect with the Force, which, I mean, that was basically me growing up. I told my mom I thought that I was an alien that had somehow landed here and been switched for her real child because I just didn't understand the world at all. Turns out I'm not neurotypical. <laughs> So uh, that may have snuck its way into this book. Just the feelings of even among the Jedi, which is supposed to be about um, connection and, and being one of this group, that there are still ways to feel othered. And when she finds her real true connection to the Force that makes her feel alive and passionate, it turns out that that's, that's not how you're supposed to do that. And so she becomes even more othered. And this is her journey of being a good-hearted Jedi. And uh, then the Clone Wars happen and become this crucible for um, questioning yourself and the larger groups that you're in. And then she becomes vulnerable and starts to get little cracks that the dark side can slip into because we know that it's cloying and lying and tells you very pretty stories you'd like to believe and then just a lot of people die. <laughs> and then this, this book has a lot of uh, Easter eggs and, and connections to, uh, to other titles. Um, one in particular with uh, Mike Chen's Brotherhood, if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure. So, you know, we start with Iskat as a Padawan and then the Clone Wars happen. And as we know, most um, Jedis who were Padawans that could be turned into knights and hence Jedi generals, this happened because we really needed all of the strong people in the field we could get. And so she gets very hurriedly knighted, but you know, they're probably not doing a knighting ceremony like every week during this. So we were like, oh, when could she be knighted? I don't know, maybe next to Anakin Skywalker. Um, so it turns out Mike Chen had recently written that in Brotherhood and he had written some very nice Mace Windu speeches that I got to steal. Um, and so, you know, we also get to see a different perspective because we have kind of an Anakin, Obi-Wan perspective on that scene, but this is from, you know, a Padawan who is not the chosen one and who is not, you know, the great Obi-Wan Kenobi, but is just a kid who's suddenly going, wait, you're giving me an award? I thought you hated me. <laughs> um... So folks can get uh, even uh, a better idea of, of this. Do you have a line, a passage that, that stands out to you that, that you might want to share with this fine crowd? Yes, I do have a, a brief passage for you, and I'm not going to do the Darth Vader breathing for when you have to turn the page. <laughs> Um, so this is um, Iskat speaking to her, her, uh, her master, uh, Jedi Master Simbervay, and her master says, Duels often bring out emotions that can otherwise be kept at bay. A fight, even a playful fight, is still a fight. It is a dance between life and death. We are all given unique gifts and challenges, and it just so happens that yours are one and the same. 
Your connection with the Force is both powerful and hard to control, but it is not insurmountable. Mastering yourself is the work of a lifetime. You have grown so much, but you are still in many ways a child. Master, I try so hard. As Master Yoda once told me when I was much younger, do or do not, there is no try. Simber gave her a small and almost fond smile. How do I do then? More meditation? Another amulet? I want so badly to be better, but it's like there's something broken inside me. Master Simber put a hand on her shoulder, the touch of rare kindness. You are not broken. We are all imperfect beings striving for enlightenment. You just have to strive a little more than most. Awesome. Thank you. Our, uh, our next book coming out this year is From a Certain Point of View. Uh, once again, it's 40 different authors telling 40 different scenes that make up Return of the Jedi. Uh, we are not revealing uh, much about this today, but the, the great Mark Thompson down at the end there does have a little something to, to reveal about this one, if, if you would like to take it away. Oh, sure. Uh, I have a small excerpt I can share with you if you'd like. So, <clears throat> Over the years, Obi-Wan had wondered so many times what would have happened if he had taken Anakin by the shoulders and shaken him, screaming in his face, don't destroy yourself to punish the Order for our failures. You're worth so much more than this. When I first knew him, your father was already a great pilot, but I was amazed how strongly the Force was with him. Another unbidden memory Anakin's round, childish face, gazing hopefully at him across a wooden table, just before Qui-Gon announced that he and Obi-Wan would not come to Tatooine to free slaves. I took it upon myself to train him as a Jedi. I, I thought that I could instruct him just as well as Yoda. I was wrong. There is still good in him. It was the last thing Obi-Wan expected to hear. These were the last words Padme had said to him. And to hear them now from her son made Obi-Wan feel as if for all that he had joined the Force and become one with the infinite, part of him could still feel small and shocked. How to explain to the young man that it mattered little if at all, whether there were shards of Anakin's true and noble heart buried beneath the rotten, scabrous surface of Darth Vader. He worshipped power and desolation, committed himself to spreading darkness throughout the galaxy because he believed that what light there was could never triumph. He is much more machine now than man, Obi-Wan said twisted and evil. But he knew Luke wouldn't be convinced. Maybe, maybe this was the moment Obi-Wan had been waiting for. Maybe it was time he told Luke the truth. But how much of it? He made his decision. And that was a short story by Alex Jennings and it's from a certain point of view. There's much, much more. That's just a, a portion of the story because there's a, a much broader point of view that he goes on to discover, and it's pretty cool. No, that, that is fantastic, Mark. Thank you. And uh, like Mark said, that was uh, written by Alex Jennings, and the title of that story is From a Certain Point of View. Um, Mark, how, how uh, you know, you, you're known for, for doing all of these incredible audio recordings. Um, you know, how do you get into character for it? How, how you know, is it difficult to go back and forth from, from hero to villain? Can, can you just talk about the process a little bit? Yeah, um, well a lot of it, like for, for this one in particular, and anytime I'm doing anything related to anything that's been in any of the films, I'll, I have to watch them again, I have to do research. <laughs> no, but, uh, so I'll, I'll watch them again to try to kind of get in there and sometimes I'll record portions. Um, and then, so sometimes it's that, sometimes when it's like the High Republic books, I'm like scouring through what, these authors have written down and looking for clues that might help me figure out what to cast or you know how to cast it and things like that. Sometimes there's concept art and I'll, I'll draw inspiration with the concept art. So it's it's a lot of fun and, I, and then I'll just kind of notate it all down and I'll 
you know, rock back and forth recording things on my phone, and people are like, are you talking to me? No, no, I'm fine, sorry. <laughs> Is there a particular character that's, that's easier or harder for you to do? Ooh, um, well, I guess um, Skier can be a bit challenging, because... Uh, <laughs> He's down here, a master Chris, and he's Trandosian. Uh, and so he's a little more rough on the throat. Um, and then Marquion can be challenging, depending on the mood he's in and how much of his hand he's showing to people. Uh, and that, that one, uh, Charles wrote this really great line that kind of uh, grounded him for me, was that you know he, he described him at one point as his voice was a breath not a scream. And so I, I, I really liked that a lot. So it was, I, I kind of was feeling like, um, I am Marquion Rowe. I am the eye of the storm. And this galaxy is mine. So it's like, yeah. That's, uh, that is so cool. That is just unbelievably cool. <laughs> that is uh, going to be hard to follow, but we will try. Uh, so next up, we want to talk a little bit about Kira. So both Charles and, and Kate, you guys have, have written Kira, uh, you know, one at the, the sort of start of her journey, one more toward the end. What is it about this character? What's so appealing to this character for you, Kate, that um, makes you want to tell her story? I think for me, one of the big things was that up until this book, my whole career has been basically nice people who do good things for the right reasons. Um, and then when I pitched the Kira book, Jen Heddle was like, so this one's gonna be a little bit different, right? And I was like, oh yes, yes, this one's gonna be very different. Um, and then there's like notes from the story group that are like, you had to look this up, right? You didn't know this, because if you knew this, it's scary. Um, and, th and, that, and that was fun. Charles? Yeah, I mean, the same. I think Kira is a is a very interesting character because she's not she's not heroic. Uh, she's not even anti heroic. She's she's pretty she's pretty rough. Uh, a lot of the things, the choices she makes, she sees people as pretty disposable and and uses them for her own ends. So to kind of you know echo what Kate just said, it's she she's trying to in the the Kira trilogy up there, she's trying to do the the right thing kind of for the wrong reasons almost, which is a really interesting character to write. Uh, and and I had just such a such a great time bringing her back into the Star Wars world. It was awesome. I think the line that sort of helped me nail it down is from the comics, which was um, when she's talking to Leia, she says, you inspire, I manipulate. And I was like, writing that one down for later. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about uh, her journey in Crimson Climb and, and when it's set. And, um, you know. So I wanted to write a book that basically starts the moment that the glass comes down between her and Han in the spaceport and ends about 10 seconds before she meets Darth Maul for the first time. Um, and there's about a year and a half in there and um, through stuff that Ray Carson had done in Most Wanted and Mer Lafferty had done in the novelization, I had a rough idea of where I was going. Um, but with the Padme books, a lot of the cast came with her Whereas this time I got to make up a bunch of people and then do horrible things to them, um, which, was, which was really kind of awesome in a creative way. Um, not like personally. And do you have a line or, or, or a patch that, that you know, okay. excites you about this book? Okay. It has no pity, no mercy, no compassion, the man in the robe continued. Its judgment is absolute. I beg you, adventurer, do not take it. I can offer you nothing in return but the promise that you will live. No Jedi or anyone like them could enter here, so you must be but a messenger. I beg you, again, please do not deliver it. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Charles, we're going we're gonna to go back to you. Uh, tell us a little bit about Dark Droids and this... Uh, horror story. Yeah, I, so I am so excited for this. This Dark Droids is the is the big summer crossover uh, that, that is happening in the Star Wars comics. So you've got Star Wars, you've got uh, Bounty Hunters, you've got Aphra, you've got Darth Vader, and all of them have stories that tie into the, 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 the spine of it, which is being um, shown and, and then ripped out in, in Dark Droids. Um, this, the basic story is like, I see a lot of you have your phones in your hands, you're holding things, that's fine, you're allowed to have your phones in your hands. The, but we all have them, the idea of the story in a Star Wars way is that our phones are very aware of all the things we ask them to do and, and all of that, and they, they decide that they all hate us for it. And they all, they all get very mad at us and start using their abilities to, to really, really mess with our lives. And, and the story of Dark Droids is essentially you have one 
one droid who, who becomes self-aware. Uh, this is a pretty timely story too, I gotta say. I don't know if you guys have been reading the news about all the, um, but I, and I, I came up with this idea before the big sort of AI explosion that we're all reading and thinking about now, but it, 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 sometimes it works out that way that, that the stories kind of echo the real world. Um, but it, it's focused on one, one droid called the Scourge who becomes self-aware and, and realizes that, that it just wants, it wants to know more things and the way that it can know more things is by taking over other droids and knowing what's in their memories. And, it, and the more it takes, the hungrier it gets and, and it starts understanding that if it doesn't, if it doesn't keep eating, uh, it will be destroyed. Uh, and so it starts trying to access the various power bases, the centers of power in the galaxy, which are the rebels and the empire and the criminal people and all that stuff. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger uh, until it is, it is a sort of a Frankenstein's monster terrifying threat uh, that, that affects all the corners of the star's galaxy. So, you know, Luke Ross and I really, really went in for full on horror with this. We, uh, I gave him lots of horror movie shot references in the scripts, like literally shots from horror movies that I like that evoke the angles and, and feel that I wanted for his, his art. And it's really, really cool and good. And I, it's very different. Uh, I think, I think y'all will really like it. Let's, uh, let's show some interior pages, huh? Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you can see, oh yeah, these are, these are pages that are, so the scourge early on when, when it becomes self-aware starts thinking about all of the ways droids are used in the Star Wars galaxy. And you can see what those, I don't know if you can read the captions, maybe for the best that you can, but it, like, it starts thinking about all the ways droids are completely integrated into society they're, they're, they're absolutely the backbone of everything that happens in Star Wars. And so it's like, well, if I could use them, then I am inside every part of, of society and I can do essentially whatever I want. So that little list of stuff says, you know, they're, they're soldiers, negotiators, uh, warriors, lovers, I think is the one on the Lando one, if that, if that stayed in the, in an, I think it did, I think it did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so on. And so it's, it's really one of the things I wanted to also explore in a way that Star Wars hasn't always taken a direct look at is how dependent Star Wars society really is on droids. We use them for everything just the way we use those phones. And so, you know, if your phone started to hate you, which maybe they do, we don't know, you know, <laughs> they probably do. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of how they could mess with our lives in, in a billion different ways. Got a couple of more pages just to give you guys a glimpse oh, yeah. of what so, you're in for in uh, August. Yeah, that's, that's the first version of what the Scourge looks like. And it, it, it starts on, I'm gonna like give a little bit of a teaser of what's going yeah, on yeah, here. Yeah, go so, the, so the Scourge um, is- That's good. <laughs> no, you can, you can, this is what you can talk about, go for it. Um, the Scourge, the scourge uh, starts in the Empire. Like it, it first sort of becomes aware in the Empire in, on a Star Destroyer and, and it, uh, it, it starts taking over the droids on the Star Destroyer, and then it's like, well, I'm gonna make this my Star Destroyer, and so it methodically murders all of the like 12,000 people on that Star Destroyer, and you see it. It's on screen, on, on panel, on page. And so this is, this is the beginning of that sequence, I think. Uh, and, and again, like we, we just wanted to push it further than, than these stories have gone sometimes, which hopefully you will like. I certainly think it's cool. We have a, a tie-in to this called uh, Dark Droids D-Squad. Now, I could speak to it, but instead of me speaking to it, we have uh, author Mark Guggenheim Yay! in the audience. So Mark, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at the last second. Most appreciated. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> uh, Hi. You get more people on the stage. I was really, I'm really enough. <laughs> No, normally we double this. Yeah. Uh, Mark, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, Thanks can, for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, D-Squad? Yeah. You know, so, well, first of all, Charles has just knocked uh, Dark Droids out of the park. You, you guys were not going to believe when you read it. And he's absolutely right. It's basically a horror movie um, set inside the Star Wars universe. D-Squad is not that. <laughs> um, there's like no horror in it. Instead, basically, and it, this was this was already spoiled by one of the variant covers, so uh, I, I feel safe saying that basically during Dark Droids, something very bad happens to 3PO. And as a result, something very bad happens to R2. And R2 is sort of literally cast adrift, uh, <laughs> floating in the vacuum of space when we pick up our story. and. He has one mission on his mind. He wants to 
save his friend 3PO. And D-Squad is basically about the droid Avengers that R2 <laughs> over four issues assembles to help out 3PO. And, and it actually has some, some wonderful connections and tie-ins to not only dark droids, but actually Star Wars 38 uh, that, that Charles wrote. In fact, um, I had I'd written the whole series and I was catching up on my Star Wars reading and I read Star, uh, Star Wars 38, and I realized, oh my God, Charles and I did the exact same thing. <laughs> I need to change mine, because this is already drawn. Um, and uh, actually, we, we took lemons and we made blue milk out of it, because um, <laughs> it, it now actually has this really beautiful connection where you're going to see the same events that are in Star Wars 38 from, shall I say, a different point of view. <laughs> By which you mean we planned it that way from the start. Yes, exactly, exactly, 100%. We, uh, we have some pages here to, to reveal as well, and uh, like you said, to your word, <laughs> there's R2 hurtling through space. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about what's going on here. Yeah, oh wait, wait, is that Chopper? Were we allowed to use Chopper? Wow, that's pretty cool. No, you weren't. Um, <laughs> what? No, you won't. <laughs> It'll all be retroactively changed. <laughs> um, but yeah, like we, we actually, we, we, when we first started talking about D-Squad, we, we actually were like, we, we need to get Chopper in there somehow, somewhere. And uh, to give you sort of a sense of what the scene is, if you remember X-Men First Class, the cameo with Wolverine, it's a lot like that. And actually what we're seeing, this is not dialogued, but uh, it, R2 and, and Chopper are having a actually pretty vicious droid argument. It's just, it's just happening in binary. <laughs> so it's a lot, and it's a lot of, in fact, we're, you know, we're following the same rules that Star Wars established so that, you know, you're not in R2's head. He's not speaking English. There are no subtitles. There's no internal narration. It's all beeps and boops and you know, every consonant and vowel there is. Um, and it's, I, I think it's actually a lot of fun. You still know what the story is and you know what these two droids are, think of each other. Uh, and you certainly will by the, the end of the scene. Yeah, you can, n n nice little tease as to what's going on there, so. <laughs> so we go from, from dark droids to another dark story, uh, Tales from the Death Star. So this is uh, <clears throat> near and dear uh, to my heart with regard to Celebration because we first started these horror stories because of a, of a lunch that we had at Celebration mm. back in like 2015 or 16. Yeah. Uh, and we've been doing these, these really fun EC-like Tales from the Crypt uh, horror stories ever since. This one has four stories in it. Mm. We're going to reveal pages from three out of the four. Okay. So if you'd like to speak a little bit to what this story is. Ah, so this is um, art by the wonderful Francesco. So this is the, the entire um, anthology. Unlike the previous Halloween anthologies, all the stories take place on or around the Death Star. Um, and we have stories that range from A New Hope through to Rise of Skywalker. Um, and so this is a story. There is something in the Trask compactors that is causing trouble, but it's not quite what you think it is. The Dianoga, right? It's not quite, not quite what you what think you it think is, it Charles. Is. <laughs> Charles, it's I mean. adorable. Um, <laughs> and so a lot, um, some bug hunters have to come onto the Death Star and sort it out. It's probably a way of doing it. That's, that works, that works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go to this one. I don't think I want to say much more about that one, to be honest. So this is Fico, who I've been working with at DC. This is a story that actually began life um, for the treasury, the um, Life Day treasury that George and I wrote, and we couldn't fit it in because we came up with too many stories. And so when we had this, um, when we, had, we knew we were doing this book, I asked um, George if I could tell the story, and he said no, and I did it anyway. Um, <laughs> and it's a, it's a ghost story. Um, TIE Fighters are on the eve of Life Day um, telling ghost stories, which is when ghost stories come true in Star Wars, um, and they experience some trouble while they're flying around in their TIE Fighters. And then we've got one more. Yeah, so hot with Juan here. Um, so yeah, this is a, um, oh, there's a zombie breakout on the Death Star. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> the Emperor turns up, he brings some stuff with him. It all goes very, very wrong. And you know, someone has to sort it out. Excellent. Uh, this is out later this year from, uh, from Dark Horse. We're gonna go into, some up-and-coming titles that, that we have uh, next. 
This is the cover to Dawn of the Rebellion. It is one of our first visual guides in many years. Uh, the really fun thing about this one is that we get to explore the uh, Dawn of the Rebellion, really. Uh, it's the you know, it's in the title. <laughs> it's uh, pulling information from Obi-Wan, from Andor, uh, from Rebels, from uh, A New Hope. Uh, Pablo and Emily uh, wrote it and just did an, a, an incredible job with it. We have some sneak peeks here, uh, just to, to give you a glimpse of what this goes into in terms of you know, the Imperial side of things, you know, the Organa side of things, and the Inquisitor uh, side of things. It's all, it's all connected, Delilah. Um, so very excited about this one. This is coming out later this year from DK. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to talk about today is a little something called the High Republic. Um, Before we talk about phase three uh, and dig into that, we wanted to talk a little bit about phase two. Uh, and George, I think you're first up for that if you want to talk to folks about Tales of Enlightenment. Yeah, so um, this is a series of stories that was serialized in Star Wars Insider throughout the, the, the phase two program. And um, they're all set on Jeddah in Kraydon's tap bar, Enlightenment. And what I really wanted to do with these stories was show what, how everything that was going on during phase two was affecting real people, essentially. So we ha have kind of regulars at the bar, and every story revisits those regulars. A little bit of time passes between each story, and there's often kind of people who've wandered into the bar and, are telling, and you know, end up telling them a story or getting involved in a conversation, or there's you know, an impact on the bar. Um, and, and those kind of regulars, it's a bit like Cheers, you know, they're, they're, yeah. <laughs> they've sat around drinking their Blue Mapper and, um, and their Retta and, and then, you know, something happens. Um, and we've had a lot of fun kind of putting together an extra story for this collection as well. So I think there were seven stories in the original series. There's eight in the book. So you get to revisit the characters a little bit later and see what's happened since the end of phase two as well. Awesome. Thank you, George. Next up for us on the High Republic side, we have the Character Encyclopedia. So this comes out later this year from DK. Um, features over 200 characters. Uh, those are not all of the characters we've created for High Republic. There, there are quite a few. Um, this goes ever so slightly into phase three. Uh, so spoiler warning for, for folks. If you're going to pick this up, you might want to read George's book first, um, or just not read this too closely until uh, you know until after you've read his book. But we've got stuff in here from Lena So, who plays a major role in Phase Three. Uh, the Drengear, who have been defeated in Phase One, uh, and Stellan, who is still dead. Um, <laughs> oh, <spoiler. Rip>. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but we're really excited about this one. We hope everyone digs it. Um, we have, after this, and this is for sale uh, this week at the show, is Tales of Light and Life. This is a YA anthology that covers every era of, uh, of the High Republic. There's stuff in here from, from pre-phase two, pre-phase one, post-phase one. Um, for the authors here who have, who have written on this, uh, Justina, can you tell a little bit uh, of your story here for this? Who's, who are the characters? Yeah, so my story, of course, features Bernestra Rowe, and we're kind of following her after the fall of Starlight. Um, because when a whole bunch of people you care about die, even if you're a Jedi, it's going to mess you up a little bit. Um, so it's really kind of a very self-contained story about what she's dealing with, where was she, right? We don't even know. Um, we saw her with, you know, Avar's, you know, battle meditation, but we don't know what she was doing or where she was. So this kind of pulls them those threads through and then maybe asks some more questions for going into phase three. So she's not dead. She is not dead. Okay, good. <laughs> Stellan is still dead. Stellan is still dead. <laughs> George, how about you? Yeah, I really wanted to revisit a couple of the characters um, that appeared first in Quest for Hidden City. So we're going back to uh, Rupert, Natani, and um, Solandra Show. Um, it's set a little bit later, a little bit after the end of phase two. Um, so Rupert is um, reaching a point in her life where she's um, you know, about to become a, a Jedi Knight. 
Um, so we're exploring the, the process of her trials, um, what, the, what lessons she has to learn to become a Jedi Knight, um, and um, what she gains from that process as well. Awesome. Cav, who's, uh, who are you writing about? So um, what I wanted to write about was the absence of Starlight Beacon. So one of the ideas of Starlight Beacon um, was that wherever you were in the galaxy, whether you were near or far, you could tune in and hear the beacon. And that's how people knew they were safe, because the Jedi were very near wherever you are. The beacon is now gone. So I wanted to talk about a, an outpost where they used to listen to that every day, and then it stopped, and bad thing happened. And it's whether they could still have hope, or whether they would fall to the darkness. And into the middle of this comes Jedi Master Keith Trennis. Awesome. Charles, how about you? Uh, I wanted to write two stories, um, and but I only was allowed to write one. So I had to figure out a way to tell two stories in one. And one of them was revisiting the relationship of Bel Zedifar and Loden Greatstorm, because I got to write those two as, as Master and Padawan in, uh, in Light of the Jedi, but, but basically never again, because, well, we know why. Um, and because Loden is still dead. Yeah, Loden is still <laughs> extremely dead. Um, but I also wanted to, to deal with, with Bel Zedifar's um, feelings about the fact that Buryaga is, is also dead. Um, and, and so I wanted to tell that story. And I've been seeing these, I, I don't understand what, I don't get those. Uh, those, <laughs> those, those buttons, the Buryaga lives things. I mean, Buryaga did not make it out at Starlight. <laughs> Uh, it's very sad, very sad story, uh, and Bell is having a hard time processing it. And so um, you you get in my story, you get a story about um, Bell and Loden doing an awesome thing before Loden died, uh, and then you have a a story about Bell, you know, kind of on a very sad search for for Buryaga's body, um, and and that's uh, that's kind of how it goes. But I've got this. Pin. Yeah, I know. I, I don't get it. I, nobody asked me about that. Maybe you guys just didn't read the story. <laughs> well, I, I think you can, you can go into a little bit of that in, uh, in Shadows of Starlight. Yes, so, I can. Talk about this a little bit, and then we'll, we'll reveal the cover to number two. Yes. Um, so Shadows of Starlight is set in the, in the year uh, between the fall of Starlight and the basically the one-year anniversary of that, uh, or, or the start of phase three. And so... It's a four-issue series, and each issue focuses on a different element of, of sort of the galaxy or specific characters that, that are going through their, their, their journey uh, through that year. So the first issue is focused on the Jedi Council specifically, uh, and, and Yoda, and how they are dealing with all of this. They, they implement something called the Guardian Protocols, which are like the rules that the Jedi Order is going to operate under during the, the duration of the crisis. And there's a, there's a lot to it. I don't want to spoil too much of it, but just like to give you an example, they, they you know how the, the younglings use um, like lightsabers that aren't, like they aren't, they're sort of like training lightsabers that can't actually cut anything? They give them real ones because they want to they wanna accelerate their training and make them be able to actually fight if they have to fight, if things get really, really bad. So there's lots of things like that that the Jedi Council decides to do um, that, are, that are all sort of explored in, in issue one. Um, now issue two, that looks like this, Ooh, is is that is Elzar Man, um, and and it is focused very specifically on an Elzar and Avar and and the way that they are are dealing with with everything that's happened to them with the fall of Starlight and the loss of Stellan Geos who remains dead and uh, <laughs> and 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 all of the things that they do. So so the fun thing about the way the series is structured is that. You know, it's, you can't hit every single moment of a full year in a 22-page comic, and so you you do little vignette bits, vignette, yeah, vignette bits that that uh, that sort of illustrate the whole story. But each issue refers to events that you saw in the subsequent or in the previous comic, so it like starts to create a, a very full picture of the full year by the, the time the four issues are done. Um, and then issue three, the third one, can we talk about that you at all? Can, you can say who's in three and four. Okay, so uh, issue three focuses on Bel Zedifar and Buryaga. <laughs> so I was just fooling around before. <laughs> um, as as they, they uh, process everything that's happened to them. Uh, and then issue four, which I am super excited, it's the only one I haven't written yet, uh, and I'm, I'm, I cannot wait to write it, uh, is focused on Marky and Roe. And so it's a full on Marky and Roe, what he's been up to in the year, in the missing year, and, and it, is, it is very, very cool. So those are the four issues. Awesome, and speaking of, uh 
of Marky, and he does grace the cover mm -hmm. to The Eye of Darkness, which is the first uh, a novel from Random House Worlds that's coming out this year. George, you can talk a little yeah, bit. I mean, how much can I say? Not it's much. Like, yeah. Not I mean, much. It's the, the Jedi are having a pretty tough time, really, uh, <laughs> at the start of this, as you can imagine. So, um, Marky, and Markian's partying, he's loving it. You know, he's, um, he's got the uh, occlusion zone that he's created. Um, we continue, like Ming Charles work quite closely on the story of kind of Elzar and Avar and what's going on with those two. Um, so there's kind of, there's a, I, I don't really want to give you any spoilers, but there's a lot going on with those two. Um, you know what we could do? We'll, we'll go back to, if, if you had to give one word to describe Eye of the Storm, what would it be? Brutal. <laughs> um, yeah, that is very accurate. <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's look at some other covers that we've got coming up. So uh, next up, we have uh, Escape from Valo. This is a cover reveal. So this is written by Daniel Jose Older and Alyssa Wong. Um, that's uh, uh, Ram Jamaram in the middle there. Those are three other younglings around him. Uh, you will find out more about them later. Uh, you may see them in that character encyclopedia as well. Um, if I had to give one word to describe this one, uh, I would say fun. Daniel and Alyssa had a hell of a lot of fun writing this, um, and it's just, it's, it's wall to wall action. Uh, and as the title says, they have to escape from, uh, from Valo. Uh, next up is, uh, Justina, the cover that, uh, you wrote for you and Tessa, Defy the Storm. Yeah. So what can you say about this one? And it's <laughs> not much. I'll say it's an incredible thing when you find out your mom's kind of hooking up with the worst man in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I can say about it. It's also very accurate. Um, uh, and as you can see from, from the center there, uh, Vernestra, plays a big role, Avon and uh, Jordan. Jordan yeah. So this is uh, coming out in March of next year. Moving over to the comics side, uh, Cav, let's look at the, the cover to uh, High Republic number one. It looks like this. Who's on that cover there, Mr. Scott? Um, so that's um, Jedi Master Keith Trennis in the middle. That is um, Tarek, and that is um, Lorna D. Who is- oh, Is she working with them? Say what? <laughs> 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 Lorna D only works for Lorna D. Yeah. Let's put it that way. That is that is awesome. So this is set on the um, right on the frontier. Um, things have gone bad for the Jedi. Things have gone even worse for the Republic. Um, and other actors in the galaxy have decided, well, this is our chance to gain some space, literally. Um, and Keeve is um, on a ship called the Geos, which is named after a dead Jedi. Um, <laughs> And she, you know, it's, it's, well, let's face it, I just found out he's died. It's shot. <laughs> um, he had such a lovely beard. Um, yeah, and so they're, they're out there trying to um, right the wrongs. And when we, we spent time with Keeve in the first arc, she was coming to terms with the fact that she was a Jedi and now has found herself promoted on a battlefield to Jedi Master with everyone looking at her. And when we left her in phase one, she realized she had to step up. Now she's seeing the reality of what that means. Um, and she has to hold everything together while she is coping with grief because she lost someone else who is very dear to her on, um, on Starlight. Um, and that's pretty much all I can say. Yeah, there, there's a lot of death in this, huh? <laughs> uh, it's a happy look, time Let's, let's in the look galaxy. at the, uh, the cover to issue two. Who or what is that? Can you, what can you tell us about this one? That is a nameless. What about in the background? <laughs> um, <laughs> and what that pointy gentleman in, in the front there, um, I don't think I can say much, but I can say what they're called. You could say what they're called. They're the children of the storm. And that's all you can say about that. And that's that. literally in my contract all, <laughs> all I can say. All you can say about that. Uh, we have two more cover reveals for everyone today. Uh, you know, Daniel couldn't be here, but we have the covers to his first two issues of High Republic Adventures. Uh, Harvey Tolley Bow is here today, if you can find him down at the, uh, the Dark Horse booth. Um, this is our cover to number one. Uh, if, again, using the one word description. 
for what Daniel and, uh, and Harvey have in store, I would say emotional for this. Uh, and then the cover for number two looks like that. And I would say heroic for, uh, for this one. So lots of, uh, lots of High Republic stuff coming up later this year. You're gonna see more about the heroes probably next month and then maybe the villains after that. Uh, keep a close eye on New York Comic Con for more reveals about, uh, about High Republic and then the, the, you know, the novels and the comics begin in, uh, in November. I will say that Lydia Kang, who also couldn't be here, is writing for uh, Titan for uh, uh, Tales from the Occlusion Zone, Chronicles from the Occlusion Zone, and that'll be out in October of this year. Um, this is just a small snapshot <laughs> of just some of the stuff that we are working on. This is not even a quarter like, of what, what we're working on. What have you been doing with yourself? I mean, <laughs> goodness sake, man. Just lounging around, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, uh, before we wrap up, because we, we, are, we are just about to, uh, we'll go down the line real fast. Delilah, what are you most uh, excited for and also what, are, what else are you working on? What am I most excited about? Well, like in general? Or? I meant like Star Wars. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs> I mean, Star Wars, I'm just so excited to, um, like, for people to read the story. Because, I mean, we, we've, we, when you find out about that you're writing a Star Wars book, you have the secret that you can't tell literally anyone for, like, a year. And it lives in your head, and it's your whole world, and then it comes out. And, and people seem to be connecting with it. So I'm just really excited to see people reaching out on Twitter and Instagram and Blue Sky that they're already, like, finishing this book in a day <laughs> and, and digging it. So that's really what I'm excited about. Um, I have a Disney Mirrorverse novel uh, called Pure of Heart. So if you play the Mirrorverse mobile game, which is basically all of your favorite Disney characters, but hanging out together with giant weapons. Um, so if you're into that sort of thing, they have it in the Disney booth downstairs, and I'll be signing it tomorrow at 12. So super excited about that. Cool. Justina? I don't think I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I am excited about secrets. So many secrets. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Yeah, you can't, you can't talk about the other stuff that you're doing now. But it's really cool. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kate, how about you? Um, I'm excited that I get to leave my house and see actual people again. That, that's been good. Um, and I currently don't have a thing. Besides the book that's coming out in October. Yeah. <laughs> which I highly recommend. George? Yeah, I'm really excited to read Dark Droids. I think that looks great. Oh. Um, and then, um, in terms of what I'm working on, I think we announced at Celebration that I'm writing the second YA book, the follow-on from Justine and Tessa's book, so I'm deep in the bowels of that book at the moment. I think for Star Wars, I'm most excited. Um, so Rebels was probably the last thing the entire family sat down and watched together every week without fail. And my 17-year-old announced to me the other day, well, you know when Ahsoka starts, we're going to be doing the same. So I'm looking forward to family Star Wars time again. Um, outside of Star Wars, um, I've got just announced a... Um, I seem to do Halloween things. So I've written a, a, really? a, a Deadpool living mummy story for the uh, Marvel Halloween um, special. And I've just teased um, a new book from Vault, literally in the panel before this, which we are describing as Hell Noir. Ooh, nice. Charles, how about you? Uh, I'm, I'm excited for Jedi Brave in Every Way, which we, have, we didn't really talk about that much, but it's, it's a picture book that I, that I wrote with my daughter, Rosemary, um, that comes out in September? October. October. Uh, and and I'm, I'm excited for it because I'm, I'm very proud of it, but I'm also excited because it means that, that Rosie will get to have a, a book. You know, she'll be a, a published Star Wars author, which is something I'm just very excited about for her. But if you'll indulge me for two seconds, I have a funny story about something that happened with her this past week. She is at summer camp right now. The summer camp she's at is like a sort of a college camp, which is... Not the coolest camp in the world, but it's the camp she's at. Mm -hmm. and, and so she is taking classes there. And one of the classes that she took is, is, a, is a story about uh, governmental structures as expressed in fantasy worlds. And so the, the professor in this class used Star Wars as an example of, of you know, stuff that has governmental structures in it. And specifically said in one day's unit, we're going to contrast the High Republic with the Galactic Empire. Wow. Which I thought was like incredibly cool. And, and I was like, Rosemary, did you raise your hand and say, guess what? <laughs> and she said, no, that would be weird. 
It's like, what are you talking about? And then it gets better because the professor was wrong about tons of stuff. She's like, she started telling me all these things and I'm like, but that's not true. Like we worked really hard to not do that. You have to, you have to correct this. This is a travesty. She's like, no, it would be weird. And, and, and so uh, these poor kids, <laughs> these poor children are getting it all wrong. Uh, but anyway, Jedi Brave, coming out soon. I'm excited for it. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> Mark, and then Mark, how about you guys? Uh, I, we mentioned it earlier, but I am very excited about the uh, Certain Point of View uh, book. Uh, I just spoke with Kevin Thompson, who mixes and directs them, and they just finished recording, I think, yesterday. And uh, there's some surprise narrators and some surprise stories, and I, I think it's really going to be a lot of fun. So, And I'm very excited about The High Republic. I can't wait to see how everything turns out. And, you know, excellent uh, uh, costume today. Oh, thank you. You know, very well done. <laughs> Finally, Mark. It's, first of all, it's very exciting for me to meet Mark. Uh, and at first, I was like, why is he speaking so slowly? And, and then I realized I listen to my audiobooks on double the speed. Um, sorry, I know. I didn't mean to break your heart, man. I, honestly, I'm most excited about phase three. I, you know, because phase two obviously took place before phase one, it's a long, long, long time uh, to get some cliffhangers resolved uh, to wait. So I'm, I'm really excited for that. And uh, I, my next Star Wars project actually hasn't been announced uh, yet, but we, we've just started talking about it. I'm incredibly excited by it, and uh, it's, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Saw the cover. It looks great. So more, more to come on that. Uh, that is a wrap for our panel today. Thank you all <laughs> for coming out. Thank you for reading and supporting these authors and our books. Enjoy Comic-Con. May the force be with you. We'll see you uh, in New York in October. Thanks, guys. <laughs>